The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by SAP. SAP Business AI. Embedded across SAP solutions, it drives immediate impact. From Jewel, your digital assistant, to AI-powered capabilities portfolio-wide, make confident decisions using your own data. SAP Business AI. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. I'm Tomer Cohen, LinkedIn's Chief Product Officer. In my new podcast, Building One, I interview some of the best product builders out there, people at the intersection of dreaming and building and learning. Together, you and I will learn from their experiences. If you're just as curious as I am, follow Building One wherever you listen and check out the conversation on LinkedIn. LinkedIn presents The winner-take-all economy breeds abuse of power for the benefit of those who can break the rules, the law, ethical norms, and common decency, and get away with it. In many workplaces, it is work as masculinity contest culture. The companies involved in corporate wrongdoing are also workplaces that are hostile to women, and the link is intentional. Women fight back most effectively when they expose the ugliness. Good morning. I'm your host, Michael Kovnett, and this is the Next Big Idea Daily, the show that gives you quick insights from the latest nonfiction books, making it effortless for you to get smarter while sipping your morning coffee. Well, Election Day is tomorrow, and soon we'll know whether Kamala Harris made it through America's highest glass ceiling and actually gets elected President of the United States. But whether that symbolic achievement happens or not, women in this country still lag behind men according to most economic measures, even if substantial progress has been made. Why this is and how to change it is the subject of the recent book, Fair Shake, Women and the Fight to Build a Just Economy, by Naomi Khan, June Carbone, and Nancy Levitt. Naomi, June, and Nancy are law professors who research and write in the areas of employment discrimination, family law, and gender theory. Here's Nancy to share their key insights. Women's fortunes stalled when CEO compensation took off. After two decades of progress in the 70s and 80s, the advancement of women college graduates stalled. Just as CEO salaries skyrocketed, we discovered that the two phenomena are linked. The winner-take-all era starts with the increase in CEO compensation. In the 1950s and 60s, the ratio of CEO to worker pay was about 20 to 1. Today, it's a mind-blowing 399 to 1. This era moved on to the celebration of finance. 57% of the increases in wages all across the economy from the mid-80s through the financial crisis went to those in finance. And tech took off running fast and making those who broke things rich. And we discovered that it wasn't just that women were not in those fields. The women who had made it in lost ground, declining as a percentage of those areas. Women in computer science peaked in the mid-80s. Women in venture capital peaked at 10% in the late 90s and then dropped to 6% and didn't recover until the new tech boom After 2014, we sought to find out why. We were shocked to find that in an era of supposed gender equality, women are losing ground in the workplace. When we started our research more than six years ago, the overall figure showed that women were, ever so slowly, gaining on men and the wage gap was narrowing. This seemed like promising news, except that after the mid-1990s, The only reason women appeared to be gaining ground on men was almost entirely due to the fact that wages for blue-collar men were falling dramatically during the same period. Then when we looked at the numbers for college graduates, we found that the gender gap in wages was increasing. In 2019, a Goldman Sachs study showed that if present trends continued, women would not catch up with men in terms of wages for another hundred or so years. Toxic companies drive women out. 
The secret to success in the new economy is breaking the rules and getting away with it. And women can't get away with it. We've identified why. Women face a triple bind. First, if women don't compete on the same terms as men, they lose. They're not in the game. Second, if women do compete on the same terms as men, they're punished more harshly for their sharp elbows or legal and ethical misdeeds. So if women are trying to compete on the same terms, they also lose because when scandals need scapegoats, women are convenient ones. In a fascinating article entitled, When Harry Fired Sally, Harvard economist Mark Egan demonstrated that women who commit misconduct in finance are more likely to be fired and less likely to be rehired than men who commit even greater offenses. Men who are perceived to be narcissists by their subordinates are rated as more effective bosses. Women who are narcissists are rated as less effective bosses. They just can't get away with those traits. The third leg of the triple bind is that when women see that they can't win on the same terms as men, they take themselves out of the game if they haven't been pushed out already. Powerful institutional factors make high-stakes jobs less attractive for women and push out many women who would make effective leaders. When women see what the terms of competition are, some take themselves out of the running. Women advance by playing by the rules, and that pays off. Those who play by the rules do better in the long run, and they happen to be women. The 10% of CEOs who are women are outperforming their male peers. Forbes reported this year that companies with women executives are 30% more likely to outperform other companies. Women who get to the top executive ranks do so by rising through the ranks, by working hard, and by winning the confidence of people who know them. Women who get to the top are more likely to be the ones who stick with a single company, where they're valued by people who know the quality of their work. They are less likely to be flashy, charismatic, savior CEOs who impose their will on a company by sheer force of personal dominance. Moreover, those in top executive positions who promote collaboration, nurturing, and relationship building, which have traditionally been considered female qualities of leadership, are those executives who are succeeding. If women are so successful, why aren't there more of them in the top executive ranks? The new winner-take-all economy celebrates the charismatic CEO who's likely to be an amoral narcissist. Elon Musk became the richest man in the world for a period when, in a two-week time span, he both beat expectations on the number of Teslas his company was able to produce and weathered a callback of hundreds of thousands of his cars for product quality defects. The stock market rewarded one and didn't care about the other. The appearance of success can justify excessive rewards in a system that doesn't ask too many questions about how the appearances are created. This all speaks to the importance of keeping women in the game. And perhaps because they can't get away with it, the greater presence of women in a company is associated with ethical and transparent practices. In the corporate space, a comprehensive NASDAQ report found that, and I'm quoting here, gender-diverse boards or audit committees are associated with more transparent public disclosure, better reporting discipline by management, a lower likelihood of manipulated earnings, and a lower likelihood of securities fraud. We associate women and feminine values with playing by the rules and succeeding. Change the system, not the women. A company's inability to recruit and retain women is a very important tell. Abusive workplaces drive women out. Workplaces with practices like those that we have been describing, workplaces that pit employees against each other, are workplaces that demonstrate greater gender disparities. These workplaces care little about supporting families or employee well-being. 
and both female and male employees experience substantial burnout and high rates of turnover. CEOs use high-stakes bonus systems to bypass traditional restraints and produce immediate results, whether higher reported earnings or student test scores. The new system that makes winning the competition for bonuses the primary source of status tends to look the other way at how the successful produce their impressive numbers. The long-term well-being of the company or the nation's public schools or low-wage workers or their children diminish in importance. It's critical to connect the dots between the abuse of power and the treatment of women. The winner-take-all economy breeds abuse of power for the benefit of those who can break the rules, the law, ethical norms, and common decency, and get away with it. In many workplaces, it is work as masculinity contest culture. The companies involved in corporate wrongdoing are also workplaces that are hostile to women, and the link is intentional. Women fight back most effectively when they expose the ugliness. This was the Me Too movement. For centuries, women suffered indignities and assaults in silence. Silence has never helped women. In 2017, actor Alyssa Milano tweeted a term that activist Tarana Burke developed in 2006. Hashtag Me Too. Within a year, there were 19 million Me Too tweets. It was a call for action and accountability, rather than a source of shame. Me Too involved turning the tables on those who have used the accumulation of power to ensure their own invulnerability. So Me Too served as a form of jujitsu, turning the power of celebrated men to act with impunity into a weapon against them, using their very celebrity to topple them. Me Too had a stunning impact. In 2018, the New York Times documented over 200 men who'd been brought down by reports of misconduct, many of whom were then replaced by women. The real fight is between people stuck in zero-sum competitions that have negative-sum consequences and those of us who see positive outcomes and possibilities. Precisely because women can't win the rigged game, they are more likely to embrace what have historically been called feminine values, caring, nurturing, loyalty to people and institutions. And, as recent economic data indicate, those values can drive longer-term business success as well. Women have been at the forefront of advancing win-win strategies. The community is more than the sum of its parts. And we are all better off when the community is stronger. Okay, listeners, you can get a copy of Fair Shake wherever you get your books. And remember, tomorrow is election day. So get out there and make your voice heard. And after you vote, come on back here where we're going to try to calm down with some big ideas from good anxiety, harnessing the power of the most misunderstood emotion by Professor of Neuroscience, Wendy Suzuki. I'm Michael Kavnat. See you tomorrow.